James Burke is an author, educator, and an award-winning television producer for the BBC, educated in literature at Oxford University. He's received numerous awards in Great Britain, Europe, and the United States for outstanding creative contributions in educational broadcasting. In this country, James Burke is perhaps best known as the creator and host of the 10-part Connections series, which airs here on PBS stations. In exploring the evolution of technology through the countless seemingly disparate events, discoveries, and innovations, Burke became known worldwide for his extraordinary overview of human development and thought. The second series, The Day the Universe Changed, applied the same far-reaching perspective to understanding how key events and developments occurring throughout history in such diverse fields as philosophy and politics, science, religion, commerce, and the arts combined to form the civilization that we enjoy today. James, welcome. Thank you very much. James, most of us here, uh, you came to life for us in Connections, and uh, I can remember hearing about it before I actually saw it. There was a lot of excitement. Can you say a little bit about the development of the thesis in Connections? Yes, I, I came to Connections after about, <clears throat> about 12 or 13 years of work with the BBC, primarily in, in areas of science and technology, and I moved, as one does, one develops, doesn't one in life, I hope, and what happened was that uh, television, and, television and I moved from programs in the mid-60s which were very much, you know, look at this wonderful gizmo and you press this button and look what great things it does. Sort of shop window, mm -hmm. uncritical, um, white hot technology that was typical in the 60s. Gradually to become, one became more aware that there was a need really to relate this stuff to people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so I began to look at ways in which one could make the development in technology relate to the way people themselves functioned. And Connections was born out of the fact that <clears throat> that I've always been fascinated by the extraordinary associative nature of people's personalities and their brains and the way people think and the way people think in the most oblique ways. I mean, people do not think like machines. They think in extraordinary sort of fuzzy ways. And, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, I'm not to denigrate them. Fuzzy is probably going to turn out, I think, in our lifetime to be the most, the most important word there is. <laughs> but, but, but so Connections was really an attempt to say, if you look at the way in which technology develops through history, you find a, an extraordinary dichotomy. Here, on the one hand, we have a society where, at any one time in history, there are clear set rules for how to behave, you know, and, the, and there is one truth at the time, and everybody either sticks to the truth or gets punished by whatever system of punishment there is available at the time, from, you know, exile to barbecuing. And, <laughs> and, and on the other hand, you have this extraordinary human activity, which seems to break every known rule. I and mean, people don't sit down and say, I'm going to invent a typewriter. They say, they say, well, for, for example, uh, they put things together in ways that were never put together before, quite serendipitously, with this amazing ability to associate things. One small example, I mean, in the 19th century, a man picks up a scent spray and uses the principle of the scent spray, together with some newly discovered stuff called gasoline, to create a thing called the carburetor. <laughs> now, unless you have the scent spray there, the carburetor doesn't exist. But a scent spray has absolutely nothing to do with motor cars. Right. I mean, I, there are thousands of those. And that's really how, what I tried to do with Connections, was to say, if you look at the process of human thought through history, you see that above all else, what we do is break rules. What we do is put things together that were never put together that way before. What we do above all is to make one and one make three. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose in a, really possibly a better title than Connections might have been one and one makes three. <laughs> <laughs> James, in, in part, you uh, showed something about the nature of creativity in that series. This being a series on creativity, I'd like you to kind of massage that a bit for well, me. Well, yes. When one talks about creativity, one, one is talking about this thing in here. Mm -hmm. And can I say a couple of things about that? Absolutely. You see, it seems to me that this business of making one and one make three is, a, is, is, is an ability that most societies in most times in history either consciously or unconsciously suppress because it's too powerful for most societies and most times to handle. Most societies are run according to a very, very, very highly limiting set of rules because there are no systems, no tools that will allow society to become freer than that. Now, what it seems to me that does at all times is immensely to 
constrain every individual's capability for creativity, and I would describe creativity as I did just now, the ability of making one and one make three. I just, let me just say something about what the scale, the scale of this thing. This tool we have between our ears, if you consider, one minute lecture, yes? Yep. If you consider that, that the brain, uh, the principal functioning elements of the brain are the neurons, brain cells, and that each brain cell is composed of a body and then little tendrils sticking out, and each of those little tendrils has many little hairs sticking out, and those little hairs come close to the little hairs of the other neurons. Any neuron has a main tendril and up to, say, 30 or 40,000 little hairy things. Okay, now each of those little hairy things has up to about 20,000 points on it where chemicals are squirted across a gap and come into contact with the little, the little bit on the other hairy bit of the other one, right? Okay. I'm not describing this scientifically because it's dull. <laughs> but the key, the key point about these synaptic junctions, to get serious for a second, the, the bits where the chemicals are squirted across are called synaptic junctions. That's where the process of transference of thought from A to B goes. In other words, that's the point at which one could say, in a fundamental sense, thought moves in the brain. There are if you look at the number of neurons in the brain, 100 billion, and the number of little hairs each one of them has, up to 30 or 40,000, and the number of synaptic junctions on each one, the number of potential ways in which patterns of thought can move through the brain, that is to say, the number of ways in which these synaptic junctions can link with each other, is more than the number of atoms in the known universe, from here to here. Now, that's the scale of the thing we have when we talk about being creative. And that's why I feel as strongly as I do, and I think I try to push as hard as I can in the programs I make, that's why I feel human beings through history have been incredibly constrained. Mm. When you consider what we have and what we have been permitted, I say not necessarily suppressed, consciously or unconsciously, what we have through circumstance been permitted to do with this unbelievable, astronomically powerful thing we have in our heads. That's what I mean about the disparity between people's creative abilities and what finally gets done in society, which is, you know, a zillionth unscientific term. But you know what I mean. And James, you've used two terms that I like and I want to explore a bit more. Uh, one was fuzzy, uh, yes. and the other one, uh, one and one equals three. I hear a harmonic, a parallel with the notion of chaos as it's now used in physics and, some, and, and actually now lots of other sciences. Am I on the right track or am I making a parallel where there isn't one? No, 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 you're not. I mean, I don't think you are. The term fuzzy, I'm using the term fuzzy almost in a mathematical sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 what goes on in here appears to be very different from what goes on in the rationalist outside world, the rationalist world that says... Uh, there is such a thing as objectivity, science can measure it, there are final absolutes that we can uh, have, use as yardsticks in order to make statements about the world. What goes on inside the head, it seems to me, is something entirely different, about as different as chalk from cheese, <laughs> in the sense that if you, look at, if you look at the vehicle that we use to express what it is that happens in here, the principal vehicle is language. If you look at what language is and how it functions, you see that, that it is, it's clear, it's rational, it's, it's objective, only on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, the cat sat on the mat. The, yes, cat, label, sat, action, on, preposition, the mat, I think. So that's very clear, isn't it? Except if you think about all the cats and all the mats and all the sitting and all the, th all the sort of combinations of all those, you're into the semantics of language and you're into what goes on here. Right. So, when people use language, at a superficial level, they speak to each other using a very tiny amount of what the, what the statement means. Yes, yes. The semantic meaning of the statement is immeasurably large. This is one of the reasons why I have great confidence in the fact that, you know, we'll never be ruled by data processing machines, because the combinatorial explosion that would happen if a machine tried to mirror what we do in our heads with language is such that it's just out of the question that such a... Th I don't know, maybe it will do one day, but in the near future, certainly not. So when I talk about fuzzy being an important word, it seems to me that fuzzy... Fuzzy is a word that expresses most accurately this, this astronomical potential for running scenarios, if you like, mm -hmm. and millions of times simultaneously mm -hmm. when you just say the statement, the cat's hat on the mat, or 
I love my mother, which is even more complicated. Uh, any statement at no, I mean any statement at all has semant every word has semantic markers that links it in some way to every other. Mm -hmm. Just as I mean, th th some of the more interesting theories about the brain suggest that the memory is an immensely associational, associational associative structure that somehow, either physically or hologrammically, all elements of the memory are all stored everywhere, mm -hmm. which would account for the fact that lots of people can have severe brain damage, you know, lose large lumps of their brain and remember everything. Mm -hmm. The brain seems to store everything everywhere. Now, if that is true, then what you're talking about is an associational structure in which everything is linked to everything. Mm -hmm. Now, that means combinatorial mathematics, which means five, you know, how many ways can you do five things is five times four times three times two. If you depart from the more atoms than in the known universe and multiply downwards, you right. see the scale you get, we're yes. talking about. Yes. Now, language operates at that level just below the surface. Mm -hmm. And that's why, uh, uh, that's why it's described as fuzzy, because fuzzy is the only word you can use to describe it. We don't, we don't think exactly. We think in overlaps. We think in links. We think in associations. We think in groups. We think, we think in many levels at once, both in time and space. And, and fuzziness is a concept which most closely approximates that. Now, in mathematics, they're beginning to move towards it by saying there are ways of saying that something is more than one but less than... Sorry, more than naught but less than one. Yes. And another one is more than one but less than two. So, so you can sort of, in mathematics, say about one and a bit. Right. Well, there's a long way to go, if you see what I mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, James, again, just uh, pushing this a bit further, because it seems to be coming together in a certain way, that I hear you saying that brain function and, the, and language, at least just beneath the surface, mm have a certain parallel to each other mm. in that they don't function the way we tend to approach something when we're trying to understand it, like 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. Yes. But rather, we need to be open to a kind of, I, when you use the term fuzzy, I think a kind of dancing with yes. a willingness to move through, to recognize that while in the aftermath we may explain it linearly, yes. that isn't what generated it in the first place. No. So The key word you said was open. Can I just change, apparently change the subject? Yeah. In 1958, a couple of Russians called Belusov and Jabotinsky were quietly minding their own business in Moscow, mixing some chemicals, and they mixed three chemicals. And, you know, according to the law of entropy and thermodynamics, everything goes from hot to cold, from order to chaos. I mean, if the theories are right. And they were expecting this stuff to go kind of brown. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it went kind of brown. And then it went into bands of red and yellow. Yeah. And the bands alternated every 10 seconds for some months until the liquid evaporated. And what they seem to have come across was what is, was apparently a defiance of the fundamental law of the universe that everything runs down, because here was something that, that with the, th the structure of the three chemicals wasn't coming together and going homogeneous. Right. It was coming together going homogeneous and then moving to a higher level of order. And what came out of that was the feeling that, uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of a concept called autopoiesis, which is self-organizing. Mm -hmm. And it appeared to be that if you have a number of things which interact catalytically on each other, you can get a situation where it, what they will do is defy the law of entropy, and instead of running down to chaos, they will utilize chaos, in a sense, to create higher levels of order. Right. And that those higher levels of order will, it will express themselves in ways of maximizing continued survival, i.e. stay open, get more whatever it is you need, whether it's energy or information or experience or whatever, so that the, so that this, the process can continue. The, the only thing that the process needs is either energy or data, energy or information. Now, what that suggests is, that your idea, you mentioned your, your thing about chaos earlier, what that suggests is that it is this self-organization principle which relies on being open, being as chaotic as possible, being as unstructured as possible, which drives evolution and everything on the planet, including, of course, this. Mm. Because if you look at the brain in that sense, you see that what the brain is is the back end of an evolutionary development where if that reaction causes a jump to higher levels of order, then obviously complexity is better than simplicity. Mm -hmm. 
obviously interreactive elements are going to are going to survive better, move to higher levels of order, higher levels of effectiveness, because they move away from simple structures and go to complex structures. Mm -hmm. Because in complex structures, there are many more opportunities, many more ways of maximizing whether it's energy information or whatever it is you're after maximizing. Now, what what if you look at life on the planet, everywhere from you know slime to us, you see that 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 life forms exist in 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 ways, the ones that have survived, have done so because they have taken, because they've stayed open. They have taken mm. the input mm. from, from, from around them and used it to become more complex, to become many more things, to specialize into subspecies, to look for niches in the ecosphere and then live in those little niches, maximizing the local end of the resources. And that as an entirety, the planet is something which functions at levels of complexity. And that evolution is moved from, from one level of complexity to the next. And the human brain, of course, is the finest example of that on the planet. Uh, and what we do neurophysiologically, it seems to me, is to, take, is to remain open. Key thing. I mean, stasis is death. Mm -hmm. Dynamism is life. I mean, any, any entity that ceases to be open, that ceases to be capable of interacting with the environment in whatever level, dies. Because the smallest perturbation, the smallest change in the environment will kill it. Mm -hmm. So the key thing is openness. It's a long answer to that. No, no, because it takes us to one thing, James. Uh, you know, my particular interest is people, and you're, you and I operate in very much the same ballpark. However, you have a certain advantage in having this background of technology and science and so on and so forth that you bring to what it all is that we're up to. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things I noticed in listening was that there's a kind of propensity built into me, and I, therefore I'm going to assume lots of other human beings, for the idea of either it's ordered or it's chaotic. And what I was listening to as you spoke were examples of chaos and order uh, moving around each other. Yeah, Something like, yeah, exactly. Something like what you said about the brain, which operates in this fuzzy uh, realm, but produces an ordered, for example, statement. Yes. So that they go together a bit. Yes. And I'd like you to say a little bit about not getting stuck with one or the other, but being willing for them to move this chaos and order, the fuzzy and the, the linear. Uh, yes. At the risk of repeating myself, the most important thing in this, in this area is openness. Mm. Uh, it is clear. I mean, what I'm trying to do with the programs and the books and so on that I do is to, is to relate these arguments about how people function to, to the rest of the organisms on the planet because we are part of it. I mean, I think a, lo a lot of people quite often don't, don't hold much by discussions of psychological matters and personal fulfillment and so on because they sort of regard them as being somehow in the realm of uh, slightly divorced from the real world, uh, slightly divorced from the humdrum business of the structure of society, how it functions on, and here you are off somewhere, you know, somebody thinking about personal fulfillment. And so on. I'm trying to say that these matters are essentially the same as every other function on the planet, and that when you're talking about how people think and what it is that causes them to think in structures or chaotically, you're really talking about how organic life functions. We are just an immensely more complex form of it than the flatworm. Although it should be said, P.S., that the, the biggest <laughs> supercomputer on this planet only approaches the cognitive abilities of a flatworm. I mean, that's how good they are. <laughs> I keep on going back to this because I keep on wanting people to realize what it is they have, every mm. one of us in mm. here. Anyway, what, sorry, to answer your question. Um, I think the most important thing about this, this chaos order, chaos order thing is that, as far as I can tell, the belazov jabotinsky reaction revealed something very fundamental about the way, the way people f really function. Now, I'm not talking about how social structures say they function, or mm -hmm. how education mm -hmm. says you work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or any of the other fossilized one-model things we've had to live with for the last 5,000 years. I'm talking about, what, what, I mean, I'm talking about what, what, what's in here to be released, if we ever find the way, socially, of releasing it. And it seems to me that what's in here is this ability to act autopoetically all the time, mm -hmm. to constantly reorganize oneself all the time, to be aware at all times that you go in steps from structure to chaos, from structure to chaos, from structure to chaos. 
And by chaos, of course, let's not use it in the old-fashioned sense of the word, where, I mean, the general public regards chaos as a, a sort of bad word, yes. as a word which means no, you know, no structure, the end of everything, death and decay. I don't mean that at all. Chaos is dynamic. Mm -hmm. Chaos is being open. Chaos is saying, I know I have to have structure, but I know I can also change it. The, you see, for me, the most exciting thing about the human brain, above all, is that the human brain does what no other organism on the planet does. In reacting to change, it doesn't simply shiver or go underground and sleep for the winter right. or poke up a leaf and say, it's sunny out there, or that, what's that funny thing, the little animal you have, it comes out and looks at the shadow and goes back in again. <laughs> groundhog, right. Right, the groundhog. The human brain says, I don't like conditions, I'm going to change the conditions. Mm -hmm. And the human brain actually takes what it takes, this, um, this creative stuff that we're talking about, and goes out and embodies it in the world, mm. changes the world, and so becomes part of the cycle itself. Uh, and it seems to me that, in a way, the chaos order interchange, as, as a sequence of events, tends to be chaos, creativity, order, change the environment, uh, move yourself to the next level up. Chaos, creativity, order, change of environment. But it's a dynamic process. As I said before, stasis is death. Okay, now we're... Does it make any sense? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. No, no, it fits very well. The, 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 the thing I, I saw as you were speaking that I'm, if you'll let me use one of my words, thrown to order, predictability, mm. n n knowing already, and that when something isn't working, I need to remain open such that I can tolerate the chaos necessary to change it. Perfectly said. And that's essentially what I got out of what you said. So <laughs> I took eight minutes, you took ten seconds. <laughs> but I had the advantage of your speaking. Now, evolving the conversation, the... Uh, Man's latest work is always his greatest work, but at any rate, uh, I want you to know that uh, The Day the Universe Changed is my favorite, and I'm going to quote James Burke at the very end of The Day the Universe Changed, and we're going to and um, invite you to explore in that area. You say at the very end, as your uh, last sentence, if, as I've said all along, the universe is at any time what you say it is, then say... Now, first, James, I'd like you to discuss this business about the universe being, the universe is at any time what you say it is. Yes. Okay. Somebody once went up to Wittgenstein and said, what a bunch of morons we must have been in the Middle Ages before Copernicus told us how the solar system worked, to have looked up at the sky and to have thought that what we were seeing up there was the sun going around the earth. When as any idiot knows the earth goes around the sun, you don't have to be very clever to know that. And Wittgenstein said, yeah. I wonder what it would have looked like if the sun had been going round the earth. <laughs> the point is, it, it would have looked exactly the same. Exactly. <laughs> and and, and what, what Wittgenstein was saying was, you see what your knowledge tells you you're seeing. You see what your model, your paradigm tells you you're seeing. I mean, and, it, and that is true of everything, including the apparently objective activities of science. I mean, if you believe the universe is made of omelette, you build instruments to find traces of intergalactic yolk. No. Now, well, and wait, I have to say the last thing. If you don't find yolk, you say instrument failure. Right. You don't say, you don't say I'm wrong. Okay, now, James, that, what you just said is, for me, the hardest thing to actually get. In other words, I can follow you in what you say, and I can see a certain validity in what you say, but I want to keep this conversation going long enough until something alters for me. Mm. In other words, I can accept the idea, but I want, it, I want a more powerful impact because I have the sense that what you're saying leads to an enormous freedom mm. and possibility mm. for human beings. Good so I, I want you to convince me more powerfully. <laughs> human beings, when they're at the level of getting ready to be chaotic, have to stand on something. They have to have a concept that, that of what is there, what is out there around them. They need this so strongly that our entire history, it seems to me, has been a history of, of attempting explanations. 
And each explanation that we have come to through history has made a statement about what the universe is about. And without that statement, and I have to be very careful here because I want to talk about two kinds of ways. What, that statement about what the universe is about is necessary for the mechanical running of a society. It's not necessary yep. for an individual human being. So, at any one time in history, we have had one truth in the model. Uh, the universe is made of concentric glass spheres, Aristotle. The universe is a giant clock, Newton. Uh, the universe isn't there, Einstein. Uh, <laughs> now, the point about having these explanations, and they go all the way back to, to the caves, is that if you don't have an explanation, everybody can't agree on how to behave, how to interact. And uh, you can handle... Now and again you see the odd, the odd blip, the odd, the odd individual human being who reacts against the model when a person says they're a poached egg. Now, all you can say about that person is that they're in the minority. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Epistemologically, how do you know they're not a poached egg? Because the agreement is a temporary agreement, and it's agree an agreement based above all, it seems to me, as everything is based, on what you know at the time, or, or what you think you know. And everybody hangs on to their model as if it were their rock of ages, because it is their rock of ages. I mean, mm. you can't stand on quicksand. You've got to stand on something solid. Otherwise, you can't crack the model. So what I'm saying is that we manufacture knowledge, that there is no way that we could ever know what some final scientific truth about the universe would be. I mean, Heisen so we don't discover knowledge, we invent knowledge. Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, Heisenberg said in 1920-odd, when you examine the universe, you change it. When you look at the universe, you interact with it. Thus, you can never ever know what the universe would have been like if you hadn't looked at it. Because in looking at it, you define it. You say, I look at it through this telescope, I look at it through this quantum mechanics, I look at it through these crystal spheres, through these prayers, whatever you do. You are defining the universe. And it seems to me that's what I want to do is to haul that over to the social side and leave it there because it's the most restrictive thing that can happen to a human being. But up until now we've had to have it because we've had to run ourselves without having anarchy. So we have knowledge manufacture to provide an infrastructure on which we can all safely stand and work. Now, I don't think that, that, that in general in the past society has done that for the benefit, to go back <laughs> to my original plan, of those people who want to be chaotic and stand right. there temporarily right. before they destroy it. Right. In fact, those people are always put in jail <laughs> or closed down or told... Or barbecue, know, right, as or you say. Barbecue. <laughs> don't rock the boat, you see, because people don't like to rock the boat. So what I'm trying to say, therefore, is that, that the universe is what we say it is because... It seems to be inherent in human beings, socially, not individually, socially, to try to find explanations that everybody will sort of more or less agree with, and then, you know, more or less function. I say more or less, I really mean less rather than more, because I, I say it's a very restrictive way to go for the individual. But we haven't been able to do any better until now. So I believe that what we do is manufacture knowledge, not, not discover it. And if we manufacture it, then we can change it. Mm -hmm. But then I go back to what I said about this wonderful thing between our ears. That's what it's for. That's what's happened throughout history. We have said, I don't like this explanation. I want a new one. That convinced you? Yes. I mean, <laughs> well, close. I want to keep going with this one. Uh-oh. Uh, first off, I, uh, as I listened, I heard you saying, not in so many words, but heard you saying that, there's a, that there is a validity to the truth as we have it at the moment even if its entire validity, it's the one that's agreed on, and therefore it behooves us to recognize it, to understand it, to know it, and to some degree conform to it. Mm. To some degree. Some degree. Yeah. Small degree. Okay. Then, but then I also hear you saying, and yet, while we're grasping it, understanding it, appreciating it, learning more about it, we should always remember that it's only invented, which then gives us the power for some openness for something beyond it. Am I following? Exactly. I mean, that's the order chaos, order chaos thing. That uh, the, 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 the agreement, the model, the paradigm, to call it what you wish, is a convenience, not a master. Not a rule. It's a convenience. And it seems to me that uh, 
there are two kinds of people in the world, those who take it as a rule and those who take it as a tool or a convenience. And it always seems to me that the more fulfilled and successful human beings, I don't mean financially successful, are the ones who take it as a convenience mm. and use it as a jumping-off point and use it to dive into the chaos, to the creativity again. Okay, now... Uh Here's one of the rubs for me. Two rubs. Rub number one. While as a semi-literate, semi-educated person, I can understand that paradigms have changed down through the era, the body of agreement has changed down through the eras, nevertheless, I find myself operating most of the time like this is the truth. I haven't yet gotten, it's kind of like I'm Newtonian, even though I understand Einstein. Uh, You're a person who's spoken in that field for a very long time and very successfully. What is going to break me from a merely conceptual (coughs) appreciation that the universe is what I say it is to being that the universe is what I say it is? I think the easy answer, I think, is to say things about a person as an individual. So I won't use that answer. I think the hard answer is, how do we get to do that and still function as a society? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to say, there should be no rules. Let's do what we like. Uh, You know, let every individual totally fulfill themselves. Well, it doesn't work. Mm. I mean, it it, it causes chaos, Mm. anarchy, chaos in the bad sense. Yes. So it seems to me that we have to look at ways, at social social mechanisms, at socially created entities that will make it possible to live as pluralist as as we're talking about. And I can only see at the moment, because what else can I see? Because I'm living in the same paradigm as everybody else. I can only see one sort of way out. And it goes back to what I said earlier about the fact that that social uh, truths of the past, the models, the paradigms of the past, have always been structured according to, A, the knowledge that was available, and B, of course, the tools and systems that were available, uh, which then limited the ways in which that knowledge could be implemented, what it meant to every individual, how it either enhanced their lives or didn't enhance their lives, how it made it possible for them to move and change or not. That area of it always seemed to be limited by the availability of tools and systems that would allow each individual to express or not express their own individuality. And in the past, of course, it was extremely limited. You know, I mean, in the Stone Age, you, you didn't do it. <laughs> uh, in Egypt, and, I mean, as society developed, it became society differentiated more and more. There became more ways of expressing your individuality, but always very limited by the central paradigm, the, the truth in the model. Mm. So I have to go to social structures or socially sourced structures to answer your question. I believe that the only opportunity we have in our lifetime, in our lifetime, to begin to express this aparadigmatic way of of living will come from the data systems that we are building today. Now, I mean, you know, it is often said, well, of course, data systems will provide a more centralized model than ever before because they provide greater means of controlling larger numbers of human beings. Yes, true. But on the other hand, history belongs to the hacker. I think, <laughs> I think throughout, history, throughout history, paradigms have been cracked, destroyed by people that nobody knew about, nobody cared much about, working away in the corner of the structure. One day, the crack goes all through the structure, it falls <laughs> down. Uh, and those are the hackers in history. And, and the people who say the people who say what you're saying. Yes, it's wonderful, but it's only a structure, and maybe I don't like it. And like all structures, it has its weak points. I'll Mm -hmm. attack this weak point. I mean, people thinking outside, they're not outside the paradigm, but thinking, being aware that the paradigm exists Mm -hmm. and saying it can be changed. Now, for my money, the only tool or system available in our lifetime as a social, as a social entity, all of us, I don't mean each person individually, But if there's any likelihood of us being able to do that, it lies in the ability that we are giving ourselves with advanced data processing systems to release people from the constraints of mass conformity. Right. Mass conformity. To allow the social structure to function as a machine, because that's all it is, it's a stupid machine. 
serving human beings whose individual potential is enhanced enormously by not having to spend so much of what it is they are conforming, uh, uh, denying the creativity that's in here, denying the openness that's within all of us, denying this colossal thing between the ears. So for the moment I can't see that... I really can't see that there could be any... I was going to say, for the moment I can only see that short of some ult- ultimately revolutionary, philosophically revolutionary way of thinking. But on the other hand, I still think we'd still have to run the place. Mm-hmm. You know, the gas would still have to come and the water would still have to function. You're right. Somebody would have to go and dig holes. So I think we are still talking about social systems which would underpin this world we're talking about. And therefore, I believe that those social systems are only likely to be provided by, by the next generation of data processing systems. Well, but I believe it will happen more than in the past, immensely more than in the past. That the structure will be there for some new relationship to order, I hear you saying. That the structure will, that, 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 that the, what's happening in data processing systems will create what I think Bucky Fuller would have called an artifact that enables a certain freedom for dealing with chaos while the order's being handled, am I following? Yes, yes. Don't, well, as long as we all recognize that chaos is in the nice sense, not the bad sense. Yeah, sorry, yes. Chaos in the creative, dynamic, life, life-enhancing sense. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I, I suppose ultimately what I'm saying is it would be nice to think that, that advanced forms of data processing would provide something like a very, 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 very simple version of the infrastructure of the brain, mm-hmm. which is immensely associational, as I've said, and which allows the interaction between people to happen at a, at a, at a higher level of order. Yes. And, and I think that's something very much to be desired. Uh, but we have to have an infrastructure on which to do it, because we have to have things in the street called motor cars or whatever it is. We have to have social systems and artifacts to function with. And, but what I'm, what I'm leaning towards is, is the thought that there might well be a, this might well provide at a very simple level systems which would allow us to function in an immensely more associative way, interactive way. Yes, so now I'm starting to see something out of what you're saying, James, that, the, that we'll not only be freed from a certain amount of routine for which we need to buy the rules, but in addition to which there's a new kind of connectivity which is made possible that, as you say, parallels something like the power of the brain, although on a much smaller scale. Yes. But you're, I, I, I hear something in the way people are connected will change, and therefore our view of the truth, sorry, our view of the truth about truth will change. My following, and can you say some more? I think that uh, the more complex our society becomes, complex in the sense that I was using it earlier, yes. the more ways in which human beings can be what they are, instead of the small number of ways that they could before, then the greater freedom we have to set up multiple forms of truth, local forms of truth, local value systems, local judgmental structures, which relate temporarily to the network we find ourselves in until we change the network. And then the local truths will obtain there. Now, this is, this, is, this is not shocking. It's happened throughout history. You know, the, uh, truths, social truths have always been temporary. I mean, once upon a time, we absolutely had to have God kings. Otherwise, everything was going to go to hell in a handbasket. Mm-hmm. What we do, we live without them now, somehow. Mm-hmm. Somehow. <laughs> the Brits aren't doing too well, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but... It seems to me that, that what we're talking about is, a, is a, a going to go back to, to, to a pluralist society which doesn't have a single monolithic uh, superior order instruction saying everyone will be like this, mm-hmm. which, as I said before, denies the essential nature of the human brain, but that, <clears throat> that we sort of live now... I don't want this to be misunderstood because the trouble is about these concepts, as I know you know far better than I do, is that you can say things and because they're understood in the old way, it takes mm-hmm. a long time people... <laughs> that we can live happily as strangers. Yes. Strangers with strangers. seems to me that tremendously powerful thought. It, in the old sense of the word, that's a bad idea because it's bad to be a stranger. You should belong to a community. You should conform. Conformity is comfort. It's good for you. So don't rock any boats. And that's what history's been about. When I use the word strangers, I don't mean strangers in that sense. I mean individuals. 
But individuals are strangers. Individuals are this. Um, we may share one fifty zillionth of it, you and I. That's a lot, mm -hmm. but there's a whole lot re left that we are that we are that is that is us. And what I'm saying is that as we begin to release that part of ourselves, uh, it will grow to be larger than the bits we share. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But I'm a, that's why I use this old-fashioned term, strangers, because to us today it will appear that people live as strangers with strangers. But but when they come together, they will come together better than they did before because. They will understand, as you said, the truth about the truth. They will understand that the local truths, the local value systems in this part of the network are a paradigm, and they will move into that paradigm for as long as mm -hmm. is necessary, and then move away from it to another paradigm, knowing that the local truths, the local variants, the local judgmental systems in time and space are, I was going to say, part of a larger structure, but then, of course, that's paradigmatically limited too. Right. right? Uh, so I won't say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> now, I'm, uh, James, in the normal course of events, reviewing things isn't very exciting. However, this is so important to me that I'm, I'm going to bring us back to a place where we were just a moment ago. Yes. One of the most powerful things in the uh, last series, The Day the Universe Changed, was, for me, in the tenth session, the last session, uh, the bit about, I believe, the woman in Scotland some 300 years ago. Um, uh, have, I got, have I said enough about it to identify what I... The witch? Yes. Yes. Would, uh, I'm going to ask you to tell us about that, because I think you can do a better job since it was yours than I can. Well, it was, that, was a, that was really me trying to give a good example of, of how, how totally alien a paradigm can be so close in time to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last people to burn anybody, I think, were, were here in Salem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe the Scots beat you by a month or two. But, I mean, the last... It was very late. I mean, it was 1700 and something. <clears throat> when people burned witches, they burned them for their own good. When you burned a witch, you released her to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. When you tortured a witch, you tortured her so that in spite of herself, she would tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And when she told the truth, she could then go to heaven. So you burnt her. Now, there is an ineluctable logic about that. <laughs> or, I, or I tried to use that little sequence simply to show how often a paradigm can be apparently totally enfranchising, totally freeing, totally all-encompassing. You don't even think about it being logical. I mean, mm. I'm saying that it was quite logical for them to burn that woman because, because that's the only argument I can bring to bear because <laughs> I, don't, I don't live in that paradigm. But what I'm trying to say was that you could do something like that within a paradigm and do it for good reasons. It was good to torture and good to burn. Nobody would have questioned, nobody would have discussed whether the woman had pain hmm. or whether the woman was guilty hmm. because guilt would have been a matter for... They used to stick needles in the women where they thought they saw the devil's mark. And this, the needles were, you know, quite big needles. <laughs> and this would, of course, enhance the fact that the devil would come out and the truth would come out and then they could burn her happily. So everything they did to this poor, unfortunate woman was good. Mm -hmm. So I was really trying to structure, a, to, to give as good as possible an example that I could, of the fact that the paradigm, that a paradigm so evidently constrained, so evidently blind, so evidently tight, uh, wrong, from our point of view, would have been totally the opposite in every sense, from their point of view. So, a couple of things came out of that for me. Number one, that a paradigm is so true, it's not even true because you wouldn't think to question it in the first place. Mm. So, the issue of its truth is not present. No, no one questioned what they were doing there yeah. because it was right. The other thing that I got out of that was I wondered who I was burning, given my own paradigm. And uh, Everybody has their witches. Yes. yes, precisely. And the thing which I loved about it, James, is that it provokes questioning at a level which, which creates new possibility. Let me make a distinction here for the discussion. Uh, I'm going to distinguish between doing a better job 
in the given paradigm, which I would suggest was, a, was affected by the law of diminishing returns, and I'll call that change, doing a better job in the given paradigm, and to use your term, cracking the paradigm, which is a different kind of change, so I'll give it an, a different term, I'll call it transformation. What interests me is this issue of transformation. What interests me is what I would call the technology, the science, I don't know what the right word is, of messing with the paradigm. And I think that the first thing I've got to do in order to have any hope of that, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to recognize that that what is so true that I don't bother to question it is not true. It's simply the <clears throat> pervasive agreement. Now, that's a, that's a hard nut to crack. Good. That's, that's... That's... Well, I mean, I'll give you my 10 cents worth. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> One of the things I try to show in all the work that I do, sorry to bore everyone with this, but <clears throat> this thing here, uh, what I try to show at all times is that the supreme ability that human beings seem to have is to think like that. Mm -hmm. It may not, be, may not be trained, it may be suppressed, it may be uh, punished, it may be limited, it may be lots of things through history, but it's always there, the ability to think like that. And it seems to me that in a sense that's the ultimate risk-taking that makes life function, evolve. Only organisms that are capable of saying, there's got to be an answer to this, and it probably isn't anything to do with a question. Uh, it seems to me that's the key way to go. Now, I'm searching for this because it's, I mean, you know, this is the major philosophical problem of our time, and mm -hmm. I'm not likely to be able to answer it anybody better than anybody else. If you have a paradigm in which the truth is so self-evident you never question it, then you're unlikely to crack the paradigm by going straight at the truth. If you can find it, because if it's so fundamental, it's... I mean, you, maybe, in identify, maybe you can't even identify it. Yes, it's just so, so self-evident you can't identify it. Well, the, all I can suggest <coughs> is that you, that you um, jump off the building. That you do this. Yes. That you think in that way. I mean, you see, it seems to me that throughout history, the paradigms that were cracked in science... Always, were always seemed to be done, as I said earlier, by hackers, but the hackers didn't say, I'm going to attack the central principle of this paradigm. They said, I'm going to attack something entirely different, which has nothing to do with it. And they go sort of that way. And what they do is to, is to attack one of the legs of the foundation of the paradigm. God, this is a mixed metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> but what, what I'm trying to say is that since everything is associated everything, mm -hmm. then there is no such thing as going off in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. No such thing. <laughs> Did I say something? <laughs> <laughs> if everything is connected, then you can't get... So, so, it's no risk to jump off the building. Human beings, that's what we're for. Uh, so, maybe the way to crack the paradigm is to stop thinking about cracking the paradigm. Uh -huh. Because, you see, it seems to me that the processing system, the conscious mind, is a, is a skim on the top. I was very interested, I wrote your transformational grammar here, because you use a, a key word for me, although, I mean, I come, I'm coming at it in a totally different way. The, the Chomskyan theory of linguistics s suggests that language, I was talking earlier about language working only superficially between you and me, mm -hmm. and underneath is this vast semantic reservoir. Uh, one of the things that Chomsky says about the way people understand language is to use what he calls deep structure. Mm -hmm. And that there are two structures to language, a superficial structure, the cat set on the mat, and deep structure, which is the fact that the cat is an object and the mat is uh, the thing, uh, and sat is an action, and so on. And that somehow, when we speak to each other, we take what is said and we go down into the deep structure to find the meaning. Mm -hmm. For example, for example, Johnny got some new toys today. He was opening the box when you came in. Everybody in this room knows, knows, knows what the meaning of what I've just said, don't you? There's nothing in the sentence to tell you that. I mean, who said anything about the box? I mean, what box? <laughs> what box? Johnny got some new toys today, period. 
He was opening the box as you came in. There is nothing in that sentence. You made a, all of you made a vast assumption, everybody watching. Now, where'd you get it from? There was no data in that sentence to tell you that there was a box containing toys, was there? No. I didn't say it. This is what happens when we communicate. We go, we transform what we're saying to a deeper level that, that relates to this semantic vastness of our personal experience, of our, of our, personal, of our character, our personality, mm -hmm. of everything that we are. That's what goes on when people communicate. They, they, they transform this level of experience to the associative, deeper structure of experience. Now, that's what I mean about saying there's no such thing as going in the wrong direction. When you want to think about how to crack the paradigm, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do. If I knew, I would be being paradigmatic. Yes. <laughs> Very good. But, James... I, I want to put together... You what... asked an impossible question. No, I'm no, sorry, I, I ducked it. I, I think... <laughs> I, I think you put something together here, and what I think you've got together is that the language, and by language I don't mean mere words, yes. I mean more like what you were speaking of, yes. the language which deals with change within a paradigm is not necessarily going to be adequate for dealing with transformation. It's never, and, it's never going to be adequate. Good, okay. Never. You have to go through language to what's behind it. Okay. Which is, and, uh, and, and how do you do that? You do it because we all do it, because that's how we communicate. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what transformational grammar is about. That, that, that the, this is why I'm having a problem answering it, because I'm not going through to my transformational grammar. Um, the, the, the language itself is, a, is sometimes an obstacle. Yes. But isn't that why you said that you may crack a paradigm by not working on cracking a paradigm. Did you say that because, for the most part, we don't share a language of transformation, therefore we have no way to directly access paradigm and the shifting of paradigms, or the cracking of paradigms, I guess is a better way to yes, say it. Yes, we don't consciously share. We don't consciously yes. share. Uh, 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 an understanding, a consciousness of, of transformation when we speak. Yes. But we couldn't speak if we didn't. Very the good. fundamental act of communication is one of transformation. So I like that paradox. And fuzziness. Yeah, exactly. And now, so now the conversation's really kind of boiling for me because you've said things that are there under what you said that wouldn't be there had you not said what you said. And for me... And I think we're saying the same thing. I'm checking with you. That's the nature of what you might call transformational grammar. Mm. It will lie in what isn't said <clears throat> in the conversation, but what is there because of what you said. Was yes. that followable? Yeah. Yes, yes. And I consider that to be consistent with and therefore validated to a certain extent by your examples of paradigm cracks down through history. That... One was not necessarily, Einstein was not necessarily working on cracking the paradigm, but in whatever it was that he was doing, the paradigm got cracked. Yes. So are we in the same stew, I'll call it? Yes. I mean, since everything is associated, when Einstein comes to theory, the theory of relativity, one of the things he's trying to do is to, is to answer the problem that was created by a couple of Americans in Cleveland at the end of the 19th century, who went looking for a thing called the ether in the universe, which was supposed to be the carrier of all electromagnetic light and, you know, and magnetism and electricity, and they tried to find this ether and failed because it didn't exist. And really, you know, Einstein was trying to solve a very small problem. He was trying to say, well, if the, if the ether doesn't exist, then there is no absolute to measure things against, and then how do we measure anything? He didn't begin by saying, I'm going to, I'm going to produce a universe which is relative in its structure. He said, how do I solve the problem of the ether? And it seems to me that usually when paradigms are cracked, it's people not trying to crack them. It's people trying to work on problems which are associated with it because, as you were saying just now, when we go through to each other and down into, make the transformation down into the deep structure, when you get down there, you're doing that. Very good. All right, James, now we've gotten uh, into this paradigm business, uh, and I want to stay there for a minute. I want, I'd like to know if... I asked you what is a paradigm, how you would illustrate that for me. How would you show me what a paradigm is? I don't mean merely <clears throat> define it, but 
you have this Physically wonderful. Physically show you? No, well, yeah. whatever you like. You have the, if you're going to do a show on paradigm. I'm doing it. Very good. That's a paradigm. That is up. Uh-huh. Isn't it? Yes. Unless you come from off the planet. In which case it's sideways. <clears throat> or down. Or who knows? <laughs> I mean, I don't know where I'm pointing. In other words, paradigms are always local. Paradigms are always intensely local, whether they're local on the national scale or local on the personal scale. Or, but paradigms are local structures. Uh, I mean, I, this is a sort of Einsteinian thought, really, that paradigms are what you say they are, mm-hmm. uh, within your frame of reference. And the great thing about Einstein is that he used that phrase, frame of reference, he said. Be aware that there are other frames of reference. Right. And so, in a sense, a paradigm is an Einsteinian frame of reference, except that before Einstein, they didn't call it that. But, um, so that is a paradigm. And James, historically, because it's always easier to see backwards, can you give an example uh, of a paradigm back there <coughs> that we no longer accept? Yes, I can give you an example of one which was to do with why the, why the planets were in the sky... Mm-hmm and which reached into every corner of society, the, ans- the, uh, the Aristotelian view of the universe. Aristotle said the universe is perfectly simple, it's logical. If you look up in the sky, you see everything going around east to west. True. We are at the centre. Obvious. So therefore, the universe is made with the earth at the centre, and what's up there is going round and round, and it must be held on something. And since we can't see any- anything holding it, it's got to be transparent and spherical. So we'll call them transparent crystal spheres, crystal glass. You can see through them. Now, we can see seven things moving, including the sun and the moon, and a bunch of stars that don't move. So there's one right out there that doesn't move, and all the others go round and round. All right, that's an interesting cosmological theory. You, you know, you're living within cocoons, or, or, or onion skins of glass. It doesn't bother anybody because they're not trying to break the glass right. by going anywhere. However, that, what that presupposes, of course, is a hierarchical structure to the universe. Uh-huh. If the prime mover created these concentric onion skins of glass, then uh, that's what's pushing them round and round. So there, there is no outside. How could there be? The outside, outside the glass spheres, doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Well, if it does exist, it is filled by the prime mover. Mm-hmm. Uh, the prime mover is the joker up there who's pushing these things round and round. And we're at the centre. Now, if that is true, then, then the heavens are hierarchical. That we are here, and they are, each one of them is there and they're there. Now, if you look up in the sky, am I going on too long? No, nope, you're if going... You, if you go perfect. up and look up in the sky, you see these things happening with immense regularity. I mean, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the same boring thing happens every night in the sky. <laughs> Here, people die. You know, Charlie's not around anymore. Uh, flowers wither. You mm. know, the seasons change. Uh, you know, you leave things alone, they rot. So Aristotle says, A, everything is hierarchically structured, and B, in the sky there is perfection, and on Earth there is imperfection. Now... That means that, that, that there are laws that separate the heavens and the earth. Since your ruler is a representative of the prime mover, he is in direct contact with the heavens. Mm-hmm. So you have yourself an absolutist or a divine right monarch. Okay? Uh, if the universe is structured hierarchically like, uh, like that, then everything has been given its place. So you can't move. The social structure based on that is static, is frozen. All the natural laws are explained by the way in which things behave individualistically according to where they were put by the prime mover. Mm -hmm. That's why Aristotle didn't care about gravity. I mean, he said, when you drop a stone, it doesn't fall because there is some law. It falls to get where it belongs. Mm -hmm. And it's only where it doesn't belong because you moved it. This is true. (laughs) Stones do not sit in midair. No. So you move the stone and you let it go and it says, thank God, and it races back to where it wants to be. And he says, acceleration, and this is the real cookie one, acceleration is expressed is an expression of increasing happiness, the closer it gets to where it wants to be. Uh-huh. So falling stones accelerate. And it explains everything we can see perfectly. Of course, of course it does. It explains everything utterly logically. Yep. That's a paradigm, and that's how it can envelop absolutely every aspect of your existence. Even down to acceleration being happiness. Yeah, exactly. Increasing, Very good. increasing Very happiness. Good. Right. So now, that brings us next to my question or my request that you now show us what effect the, a paradigm has on us. Again, yes. now we've got a paradigm. You now, what does it do to us? Historical example? Oh, good. Yes. Well, I'll use the same one. 
Uh, the fact that Aristotle says that the, the heavens are perfect and earth is imperfect and that um, God is up to God. He wouldn't have said God. He would have said the prime mover. The prime mover is up there and we're down here. Um, motion up there is circular, of course. Motion down here is straight line. Mm. You drop a stone, it doesn't curve. It falls direct to the ground. <laughs> okay, so anybody who says motion is circular is messing with a paradigm, which is why they burnt people. Because when, when people after Copernicus... You see, Copernicus said... Something wrong here, he said, about this Aristotelian paradigm. He said, now, we don't know whether he's... Actually, let me go back on that in a second, because he wasn't trying to crack the paradigm. Right. What he comes up with, with, with is a way... One of the things you can't explain with, with this Aristotelian thing is why Mars goes backwards from time to time. <laughs> I mean, it goes round, and then it goes like this, and then it goes like that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no way you can explain that unless you put little mini-spheres on the spheres, so that as you ah. watch the thing, it's going like this, and sometimes it goes like that. And then right. It goes, well, yeah, except that to make the solar system work, they had to have more than 90 of them. <laughs> and even they thought this was an extravagance. Bit, yeah. right. <laughs> so, so what, what Aristotle is saying, therefore, what, what Copernicus is saying is Aristotle is wrong. Now, since the social structure at the time in Western Europe is tied tightly to a church that says Aristotle is right, and if you say Aristotle is wrong, you can get taken seriously dead. <laughs> so, so when Copernicus comes out with this, he comes out with it, sensible fellow, on his deathbed. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, Copernicus, Copernicus kept publication until the day after he died because he knew he wouldn't last much longer after that. Now, the point is that, of course, they, the, the people who were firing guns, for example, noticed that cannonballs didn't do that and that. Right. They went like that. Right. They curved. Now, Aristotle said curving motion couldn't happen. So, now, in, under normal circumstances, of course, the cannonball people would have been burnt or, or thumbscrewed or something. But <laughs> since the cannon was a great new thing for everybody to use, there became a sort of mixture of uh, views. The, you know, the, the military commanders and princes wanted cannons because they wanted to, in, you know, up their standing by knocking others down. And... And so they wanted cannons to work best, so that you had to measure what happened and how you hit the castle properly by shooting the right amount of... So it was important that this... this. So there was, a, there, was a, there was a divergence of views here. If the cannonballs curve, Aristotle is wrong, but how can I, as a prince acting on behalf of the Pope, agree with this? But on the other hand, if I don't agree with it, I don't knock the castle down, or I don't win it for the Pope. Right. Make up your mind. Right. <laughs> so... <laughs> so... So there you have... A, there you have... There you have... Uh, 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 a paradigm that, c that controls and confuses, but it's, I mean, controls. The Pope said, j actually, the Pope got out of it by saying, just do it. <laughs> and it <laughs> leave the problem to me. I wanted to say one thing about why Copernicus broke, cracked the paradigm. Copernicus wasn't cracking the paradigm. He was trying to work out when Easter was. Right. You see, the calendar was about... <laughs> it's very important for Catholics to know when Easter is. And the, and the calendar was about 11 days out. Because, because the calendar, you know, to get the calendar accurate, an astronomical calendar, you have to relate the movement of the sun and the moon, and you can only correlate those things once every... Well, there's one cycle at 19 years, another one about 200 and something. Well, right. nobody lives long enough. Right. So the calendar was haywire, and the problem about the calendar is that you're not allowed to eat meat on Fridays, or you're not allowed to eat meat uh, in Lent. Mm -hmm. not a, right, now, if, if it wasn't Friday or Lent, and you thought it was, you, were, you know what I mean? Yes. You said, well, I won't eat it today... <laughs> And it wasn't Friday, and then the day you were eating meat, it was Friday. Right. God was up there saying, what do you think you're doing? Right. Now, this is a real problem, not now perhaps, but it was to them. So the, the East, sorting the calendar out was a tremendously important theological problem. While solving that problem, Copernicus cracked the core paradigm that supported the church. Mm -hmm. That's why you can't crack it by going at the truth. You've got to, you've got to be doing some other thing over here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Copernicus is probably the best example in history. Because the last thing he was doing was trying to bring the whole thing down. He wouldn't have wanted that. Uh, he was trying to make it easier. And actually, the church fended it off for a long time by saying, well, he's only talking ath a mathematical fantasy. He, you know, he's talking math language. You know? uh, when he says that the, that the Earth is just a planet going around the sun, that's all right for astronomers and calculating calendars. God knows he's wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> as a... As a uh something on the side, it was okay, as long as it wasn't the central thesis. Well, you see, you could always get rid of it. And this is, this is the terrible problem, the one you set me in the first place and I couldn't answer. The terrible problem about a really complete paradigm is that it's very difficult to, to doubt. You see, uh, in the 16th century, the church had this final backstop position. It could say, well, Copernicus says this, 
uh, Galileo looks up and sees satellites going around Jupiter, so the Earth isn't the center of everything. On the other hand, what they said, what Galileo is seeing is not necessarily what's up there. Uh-huh. What Copernicus is saying mathematically is not necessarily what's happening. These are artifacts created by God to confuse these people. <laughs> and there's no answer to that. <laughs> not at all. Yes. Uh, so the... I mean, I'm just saying that's how complete a paradigm can be. Yes. That when you look for an exit, there isn't one. And, and if there is one, someone will create a bubble to close it. Uh, I if, also if hear possible. you. Yes, if at all if possible. possible. Yes. What... James, why is there this ridiculous level of resistance to the alteration of a paradigm? I mean, it does, it's not enough to say that it's uncomfortable to have your paradigm shift. I mean, you don't burn people because you're uncomfortable. You don't thumbscrew people because you're uncomfortable. Well, I'm biased. I'm biased. I mean, I think that society through history until now has... has been run for the benefit of a very small number of people. And I don't mean this politically. It's not a political statement. I mean, the limitations of the tools and the systems at any one time made it, made it possible to function only in that way and, incidentally, make life extremely nice for a small number of people. Mm. Incidentally. Um, now, they don't want their paradigm cracked. I mean, any time any innovation comes along that looks at all risky, it is appropriated immediately. You look at, um, look at hieroglyphs. The theocrats grab hieroglyphs. Look at the water wheel. The princes, the princes make it illegal to use a water wheel unless, uh, unless you have their permission. The printing press, I mean, the first thing that happens, censorship. Right. Everybody, the first thing all the kings and princes and uh, prelates do is to say, yeah, you can have a printing press. In my town, I tell you what to do with it. Right. So what happens is, oh, the, I mean, the telegraph in Europe, uh, here it didn't happen, but everywhere else in the world, the telegraph is grabbed by the local authorities because it was the perfect way to control people. Right. So what happens is that any time the paradigm... Anything, anytime something comes along that looks like shaking, cracking the paradigm, moving it, the status quo, the vested interests, and mm-hmm. again, these are not political statements, vested interests will always attempt to prevent it from having any effect. Um, and that's why so many people find it difficult to be aware of the possibility of changing a paradigm, because it's too damn difficult uh, to fight the system, if you like, that says... It's comfortable to leave it where it is. Mm. I mean, we fight change. Society in general is conservative because we've been taught to be conservative. We've been taught that it's safer in the long run not to rock the boat. It's safer in the long run to conform. It's safer in the long run to believe this truth as Mm. being permanent. Now, speaking about safe and not safe, speaking about taking a risk, I'm going to read you a quote. Uh Uh-oh. It says, but I, th- uh, but I think what the computer does is to give us a totally new gestalt, a totally new perceptual box, I hear that as paradigm, yes. uh, in which to put it all. When that happens, you get a massive redistribution of values uh, systems. Here's the risk. I'm going to stick my neck out here. I think it's going to bring us to the realization that the future can be manufactured. Who said this nonsense? (laughs) Did I say that? (laughs) Exactly. So I want to talk a little bit about, I want you to talk about, what do you mean the future can be manufactured? And how does that, how does whatever you mean relate to paradigms? Mm. Or okay. transformation. It goes back to what you quoted the last time you quoted about if, you, if the universe is what you say, it is say. Yes. Um, we have always manufactured the future. The future doesn't happen by accident. I mean, if we didn't do anything, the future would, uh, would, would be indistinguishable from the present and the past. We wouldn't give it a name, would we? We'd say, ho-hum, another one of those. <laughs> well, we would. I yes. mean, there would be no differentiation between the past and the I mean, the only reason we give them names is because the past is different from the present if the present exists, and the future we don't know about, but we, we expect, expect on previous, uh, on previous uh, uh, evidence for it to be different. Yes. As contrasted, by the way, with the part about the Nepalese and the Buddhist, who will see the future as a rep- repetition. Yes. But then, you see, the st- it seems to me the strongest... I'll duck sideways there, because yep. you brought that up. The strongest paradigm is always the one that relies on belief. Mm-hmm. Because you can't fault it. Exactly. You can never fault belief. Um, you can't question it. You can't, you can't 
bring evidence no, to... No, it does not rely on evidence. Exactly. And so, therefore, it can never be faulted. I mean, all you can say is I disagree with you. Yes. But if you... If, if, uh, if in, in the case, for example, of some Eastern religions, the, the religious structure is such that it runs society, then society is taught to fit. And, I mean, if you've never been taught to use tools, you won't know how, as it were. Mm. So, mm. But I'm not going down, getting down too hard on those people, because in some ways our paradigms are just as strong. Um, and just as believed, even though they're based on evidence yes. and can be falsified. Except that, except that we come from a culture that ultimately, I suppose, believes in the possibility of change. Yes. Western culture, Christian culture, ultimately, believes in, in the fact that uh, man is capable of improving it, its, her, him, itself. I used to say himself, can't now, can we? Mm. Um, uh, so we, we live in a culture that believes that tomorrow should be different from today. And it seems to me, therefore, we have always made it different from today because, curiously, is a sort of paradox here because in the, way, in the search for an explanation, it seems to me, at every stage of, so of social development, in the search for explanation, we've always, dis we've always ruined, uh, ruined the game because what we've done is we've said, I don't understand this. I must find an explanation for it. And when you find an explanation for it, it proves that what you were thinking before is wrong. Mm -hmm. So in looking for order, we find chaos. And then we go back to the order, chaos, order, chaos, order. Yes. The dynamism of, of what we are. Um, because we can't help it. I mean, try not thinking. You yes. Can't, <laughs> we can't help it. It goes on night and day, every millisecond of the time, this thing. So, so it seems to me that, that when, when we say, how do we manufacture the future, we, I, I say we, the way we've always done it. Um, the, the future, is, is, the future isn't going to come from somewhere else. It's going to come as a result of today having been what it was. Yes. And therefore, what we make ourselves today will dictate what tomorrow will be. I, I mean, I can't see that there's any other way that the future could, could become today, except as a result of what today is. And therefore, in that sense, we are all involved uh, in making the future become what we want it to become. What specifically that should be, of course, is a social question. Uh, it seems to me that through history, I, I, I have a particular interest in science and technology, because it seems to me that science and technology have brought us the greatest material changes in what the world looks like, the kind of world we live in. Um, and when I say that's a social issue, one is talking there about whether or not the future should be a future in which we develop more mechanisms so that we decide socially what science and technology shall do to us and make the future what it is. And I believe with our new data processing systems, we'll be able to do that. I hear people crying, wait a minute, what about f you know, freedom of inquiry? There's never been freedom of inquiry. It's always paradigmatic. Uh -huh. I mean, everything is socially sourced. So... So it doesn't bother me that there should be a time in the future where society would say, no thanks, no more nuclear physics. How about a little more biotechnology or whatever? Right. So I, I suppose the short answer is we will create the future because we always have. I believe in terms of what the physical nature of our future will be, the machines in it, the systems in it, and therefore the way people are what they are and interact the way they do is dictated by the decisions we are beginning to make about whether or not society as a group, why, whether individuals whether individuals in that sort of fuzzy web that I would like to see us all live in can act to say, right, we'll have that. Okay, very good. Because we always did. Very good. Now, a couple... Uh, James, we've got what I call a stew here. In other words, uh, we've got things moving. Yes. And as I said earlier, there may be more to what isn't... Be there may be more being developed in what isn't being said that than there is in what is being said, but what isn't being said is there because of what is being said. Now, I want to take you to one of the places in the stew, so I'm going to stick my finger down here, and down here it says, now wait a second, James, this idea that there's no fixed universe out there, it's the way we say it is, sounds like solipsism. Solipsism, yes. Now, but I'm not saying that. Good. I'm not saying that. I mean, that. Not, not good that you're not saying that, but yes. tell me what you are saying. Well, I'm not saying there's no real universe out there. Of course I'm not saying that. There are, I mean, what I'm saying is that we live by the descriptions, yes. and the descriptions change. And you may say, well, that's, that's all right, that's fine. I mean, who cares? Well, I care because the descriptions burn witches. The descriptions right. deny people freedom. Yes. The descriptions limit people immensely in the way they can use this wonderful thing here. The descriptions are the paradigms, mm. the explanations, and they change constantly. Um, uh, the universe has changed since the beginning of human recorded time, since before then, because we have said it's different. We have described it differently. 
whatever it is out there, there, there I, I trust there is some irreducible reality out there somewhere, but all we have is the omelette universes we invent. All we have is the version, today's version. And as long as we recognize that today's version will become outdated with tomorrow's version, then we can start to look at the way there is a, there are, there is a continuity, there's a constant in change, that the only constant to hang on to is that things will not be the same. Uh, that that should be an abiding, if, if there's a sort of, if there's a sort of um, supra-paradigmatic thing running along, where, to one side or above, whatever you like, <laughs> it should be that awareness that, that the only constant in life is change, and that those who are capable of understanding that will, will benefit better from the paradigmatic leaps that are made than those who don't. Okay, now let me try something out. So what I hear you saying is there may or may not be, but let's take it that there is something out there which is a certain way, and we haven't got anything to say about the way it is. However, we are constituted by saying, and, our, and the way that which is out there happens for us is through our own saying, through the, our saying is the paradigm. That's right. That's what I meant about if you, if the universe is what you say it is, so say. Good. Now, so we've taken that step. Now, the next step is for me to ask you, yes, okay, we postulate a something out there about which we have nothing to say, but do we have any access to it directly? Is there any way of knowing it or is it the case, as you said earlier, that by looking at the universe, we alter the universe, and therefore we've never seen the universe, as it would be without a paradigm? I'm tempted to say it's irrelevant. I, I'm tempted to say answer. that the most important thing about knowing is knowing you know. Mm -hmm. The important thing about paradigms is knowing that paradigms exist, yes. and, that, and that one is, as it were, a dynamic or a process rather than a structure. Because the structure is unimportant. The structure changes. The structure of today's structure will be outdated tomorrow. What is important is to be aware that one is part of a process, that one is part of a that, that one is a dynamic, that, that that as knowledge as knowledge gives us new structures within which to live, they none of them may be what's really out there. But it seems to me that that's in a sense irrelevant. Hmm. What is relevant is to be as aware as possible. Of the, of, the, of the process nature, of the dynamic nature of what life is and what one is when one uses this wonderful thing here. Uh, so I don't care that we don't know what's out there. Okay, so I, I want to make this clear that at least in this conversation, you and I have come to the place where we're willing to say that we, as we think about it, in all likelihood, there is something out there. We haven't got any direct access to it. All of our access is through our paradigm. And as a matter of fact, when we go looking for it, we look at, for it through lenses which alter it and with light which alters it and so yes. on and so forth. Yes. And besides which, as a practical matter, it's somewhat irrelevant. I mean, we've actually said that. Yes, I, yes, yes, basically, yes. Yeah, okay. But anything about that you want to clean up? Yes, I want to make sure lead? that as a practical matter, we don't just say as a practical matter socially. I mean, as a practical matter in terms of a human being's individual existence and uh, development, I call that a practical matter too. Okay. Then it's irrelevant. And socially, what makes it relevant? No, no, it's irrelevant. Okay, socially. very good. Okay, very good. I just didn't want a practical matter simply to refer to the social oh, nature. Oh, yes, it, exactly. also to the person. To the per side. person. Okay, that's clear now. Now... We're going to run out of time, and I, we need more time. Let me see how I can do this quickly. Um, uh, James, I'll tell you where I want to end up, and I'll tell you the step I want to take, and then you can help me better. <laughs> I want to end up with something you said, which before our discussion at dinner last night and our discussion before a uh, moment... I entirely misunderstood what you were saying, and that was, we may, quoting, uh, I, I believe this is a quote, James, yes. I hope it'll uh. be a quote, uh, uh, we may be moving to a no-paradigm culture. So that's where mm. I want to get, but mm. I want to do something in between. What I want to do in between is, how can you turn around fast enough to see the paradigm in which you are? In other words, how could those Scots people yeah. have turned around quickly enough to have seen that they were in acting in a paradigm rather than in the truth. Uh, How do you get to... Yes, I, I, I mean, I, wanna, I don't want to be burning people, and I'm suspecting I may be. 
I think what I think one of the the only answer to that I can think of is the accelerative rate, the accelerating nature of the way we have changed the world through history. That that paradigms tend to tend through history to last less long. Mm. Uh, Aristotle lasts two thousand years. Newton lasts two hundred. Einstein. There are already people <laughs> who question some aspects of relativity of his theory. So paradigms generally tend to last less long, and it seems to me that they last less long. Uh, in relation to the systems with which they can, as it were, not be questioned. Because I mustn't get into that business of people looking at, seeing, looking at the truth head-on, because I'm yeah. sure people don't do that. But that the systems which exist for people to, to think associatively. Okay? Early on in history, there are very few. The more we get towards the present, there are increasing numbers. And it seems to me that as mankind's knowledge proliferates, as I said earlier, is driven to proliferate, the more little ecological niches out there in the intellectual sub uh, ecosphere exist, the more somebody out there is going to rock the boat, uh, be the hacker, whatever. And all I'm saying is that through history, those, the numbers of niches have proliferated. So that I would say that, that the speed with which we can move towards this no paradigm planet, b b b system situation, relates directly to what I was saying earlier about the next level of data processing systems. I think that's a major step in the direction of uh, upping the rate at which we are able to question the paradigm. Now, that, of course, that brings a problem because then the paradigms change and with it the value judgments, the value systems, more rapidly. And then you have the problem of how society functions in that kind of situation. And I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think somehow I go back to the fact that we, held, we hold ourselves together by the awareness that we are holding ourselves together. Okay, very good. Yes, you said earlier the most important part of knowing is knowing that you know. Yes. I think you said something close to, and please correct me if I get it wrong, that with regard to paradigm, the power is in knowing that you are in a paradigm yes. rather than the truth. Yes. And See, I heard you say something parallel to that just now about dealing with the rapidly changing paradigm. You see, going back to your transformational idea and my remarks about the size of the human brain, it really doesn't, it really is not a problem if our entire consciousness is taken up with paradigmatic limitations, because our entire consciousness is an infinitesimally small part of what goes on inside. Right. And that's the bit, when you get down to the deep structure, the transformational side, that's the bit that will bring the paradigm change. Okay. So there's no point in fretting and staying awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> James, uh, yeah, I like what you brought up there, because I hadn't noticed that before, and I think that there's, that, I mean, what you said seems valid to me, that the rate at which we crack paradigms seems to be increasing. Mm. And you talked about being able to deal with cracking paradigms uh, maybe a couple in a lifetime or more mm. than a couple in a lifetime. Yes. And I'm, 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 I'm going to provoke you if you've got anything to say, and you may <laughs> not, but if you don't, we'll go on. Right. Uh, about a transformational grammar, a language designed to deal with paradigms at the level of paradigm rather than at the level of metaphor? The trouble, you see, it seems to me that the transformational grammar is always moving. Sorry, I'll start this again. Transformational grammar, for me, the deep structure of language and communication, is the closest thing we get to actually looking inside the head and seeing what's going on in there. Mm. And we never really get to look at that because we live with a superficial level. We live with the, uh, Johnny got some new toys today, he was opening a box when you came in. And we're never ever conscious of the fact that we knew what was in that box, mm -hmm. even though we, it came out of nowhere in that sentence. So it seems to me that, that in a way, the semantic associative structure of the human brain is cracking paradigms all the time. Whether or not society allows oh, us... Ah, yes, yes to bring that paradigm cracking out will depend on who says what you're allowed to say at the superficial level. In that's other words, the social good. structure. And therefore, that's why I say don't stay awake and fret at night because right. now all I, when I say we move towards a, a paradigm-free society, yeah. I don't really mean that. I'm sorry I said it because what I really mean, well, Tom Kuhn, sorry, he said paradigm in the first place. <laughs> but but uh, what I mean is not so much that we move from to a paradigm-free society, but we move to an awareness of rolling paradigms, if you like, mm -hmm. temporary paradigms, mm -hmm. local paradigms mm -hmm. I was describing earlier, where we, you know, where we lived strangers among strangers and we simply changed our networks depending on where we were. The value judgments altered, 
uh, and everything else did, but we were aware that we were moving from A to B in, in a very, 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 very stupidly simple way. When you go abroad, you do it. When you come to England, there are certain things you can't do. You accept that. That's a new reality. You, you accept that there are multiple truths. There are truths for the English and truths for the Americans, or truths for whatever. So, I mean, we do it in our, in our daily lives. I'm saying that, that, that um, in terms of what we might describe it within the American paradigm, within the British paradigm, that one will become increasingly aware of the local nature of the paradigm and uh, the fact that multiple levels of paradigms... There's a paradigm for everybody in this room mm. and everybody watching this program. Mm. I mean, there are as many paradigms in a sense, individually, personally, as there are human beings. Mm. Uh, we live with that fact all the time. I think all we have to do is to make sure that society begins to recognize yes, that that's going on. Yes, very good. And there's a certain power in doing so, and there, both a power in that if you recognize that you're always in a paradigm, you've got some wherewithal to move through different cultures, different paradigms. Uh, you've got some comfort, I don't like the word, you've got some at-homeness, being at home uh, in, in rapidly changing paradigms, and maybe most importantly, you've got something to say about the paradigm in which you are in. Again, I'm not arguing directly necessarily, mm, mm, mm. but at least you're there for it. You can participate in it. You're not merely the effect of it. I suppose in a utopian existence, I would take what you've said and go a stage further and say that if in an ideal society, every individual, by doing what you've just described, would be a, a giving part of the overall community, the overall group, uh, of course would receive, but then we always receive. Mm. Maybe we receive from kings, we receive orders, we receive instructions to be limited. But, but going the other way is something that has only just recently become possible in history. And it seems to me that, that what we need to do is to release people to be able to give what it is they have to society. And it seems to me that ultimately, you know, the emergence of every individual's paradigm but, but then we are more than that. I mean, Walt Whitman once said this marvellous phrase. He said, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. I contain multitudes. <laughs> it seems to me that's the most, perhaps the most profound thing to be said about everything I've tried to say tonight about the human brain, today yes. about the human brain, how it functions. That people are multitudinous, chaotic, self-contradictory immensities. And that society has done nothing to help any of that come out through history. <laughs> Okay, James, a couple of last questions. The first one is about the possibility for the future. Uh, we gain practice. We are beginning to design our own future. This is beginning to be an awareness. This kind of a conversation could yes. not have happened uh, over a large group of people as it is not very many years ago. And the concept of paradigms 30 years ago didn't exist. Exactly. Right. This well, guy had a lot to do yes. with putting it on the map. And we're beginning to know we know. Exactly. Very good. So say a little bit about what you see the future like as a possibility. I'm not asking you to predict it. I'm asking you to tell me what's possible out there. Oh, that's very hard. Well, it's very hard because I have to, I have to nail my colors to the mask. Exactly. I'm not used to doing that in public. I'm a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an optimist because I think the only people who aren't optimists jump out of the window. I mean, there's only two things to do, be optimistic or give up. Right. So let's say I don't want to give up. I suppose I believe that the future... I, I, you see, I believe that the, 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 the next generation of data processing systems is the first step on the way to releasing the incredibly large pool of talent that lies in people at large. There is a vast reservoir of talent and imagination and creativity in every human being. We have all, given or taken, infinitesimally unimportant amount, the same size brain as Einstein. Mm. All of us. <laughs> the fact that we don't, we don't, quote, use it, unquote, to be fulfilled, successful, brilliant, wonderful, it seems to me is above all the fault of the limitation of the social structure until now, and not because people are stupid. I don't believe, unless somebody has a disease, that there is such a thing as a stupid person. There is someone who, whom the system has failed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whom a very limited system, in our case existing almost unchanged since the Middle Ages, has failed because that person's idiosyncratic way of functioning could not possibly be handled by 
the educational system, religious structures, governmental policies, whatever you choose over the last 5,000 years. And it seems to me that, that if, if, we could, if, we're, if we are to do anything with, with the future, and it's up to us, we, as I said, we make the future, then I think we have to decide to make it in such a way that these data processing systems begin to be tools with which to release some of the immense potential for change here, lies between the two ears. And I would, I would like... I mean, James, give that example about uh, educating a child with... Oh, well, I see. Well, I, the reason I'm optimistic is because there are, there's the beginnings of a glimmer that people are beginning to think in those terms about how to use these data processing systems. Uh, there are places like Brown University uh, in Rhode Island where they're beginning to experiment with some stuff called hypermedia. And some of your audience will know this already, that there's a, there's a new, fairly new piece of software called HyperCard. And basically what it does is it allows you to connect things. Sorry, this is not a commercial. <laughs> it allows you to, to... Here you have a computer, you have it. It has a load of data in there. And, you know, the great problem about data glut, you know, the thing we mm. must never confuse about the coming information age is that data is the same as knowledge and wisdom. Very good. It isn't. I mean, just because you have a million facts doesn't mean a thing. I mean, because you can have the biggest library in the world, and if you don't know what to look for, what the question is, what the answer means, it's valueless. What, what is beginning to happen in a very, very small scale is that the new uh, levels of data processing uh, abilities make it possible for a, a computer to function, as it were, three-dimensionally, um, conceptually, three-dimensionally, yeah. in time and space. So that instead of saying A and then B and then C and then D, you're able to start saying, well, let's look at a 3D structure for this bit of knowledge and say that... This fact is only a fact because of its contextual relationship with all other knowledge. In other words, in the ideal sense, any document created by the hypermedia technique would contain the universe. Mm -hmm. Footnotes, except that, you know, going back to my remarks about semantic markers on words, words are not labels. I mean, mother isn't my mother. Mother is anything mother could possibly mean. Exactly. And that is combinatorial explosion large, right? Mm -hmm. So... Mother Earth, etc. Uh, yes, or, I mean, if I just think of my mother and the associative thoughts that come in when I think about hmm. that, I could probably sit here for the next ten years. Exactly. Right. In I mean, fact, you'd get the whole universe if in, you sat you long would. enough. Exactly. Now, what this new technique aims at is doing something like that. Uh -huh. It's to say, here is a document. You know, that, I mean, anything anybody says has semantic overtones. Any document relating to something uh, has, has connections. Uh, nothing exists out of context. Everything exists associated with everything else. And what the hypermedia people are trying to do is to say, let's introduce this to education. Let's say to children, um, instead of saying, okay, we're going to learn about so-and-so today, here is the book, this is the way, get it right or you fail. Mm -hmm. Denying the idiosyncratic talent that everyone has. What this means and is... And calling them stupid <coughs> for doing so. Of course, of course. I mean, you haven't got a PhD, you must be stupid. What, what, I mean, you know, what, you, what, 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 I, what all of us have who have qualifications is the good, great good fortune to have fitted the system. Yes. That's all. Good. That's all it is. Um, yes, we build good bridges, fine. I mean, they don't fall down, but that's, that's incidental. Um, so what the hypermedia people are trying to do is to say, let's try and tap the idiosyncratic way in which each brain approaches the universe of knowledge and see if we can find ways of letting it get at it in that same idiosyncratic way. So on a very, very small scale, it is teeny-weeny scale, they are saying to children, OK, here's a subject. Um, if it bores you, just stick around for 10 seconds. That's what teachers are for. They can say, sit there and don't move. Mm. Because in the first 10 seconds or hour or whatever you choose, you're, you're going to pique the child's curiosity by some extraordinarily oblique um, no. aspect of that knowledge. Because you don't say, here. You say, here, 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 here. Look at all these. Look at, you know, stop me when you think you like it. And they right. the child says, that, that, what's that? And that's the port of entry mm -hmm. to the web mm -hmm. of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there is a sort of three-dimensional structure, a network, through which the child then follows what it believes to be its own idiosyncratic pathway, which motivates it, satisfies it, fulfills it, and incidentally takes it through carefully structured nodes so that when it comes out the other end, it knows what all the other people in the class knows, you see. Yep. But it does it its way. Yep. Very good. Now, that's how the brain functions. I mean, of course, immensely more complex. Yes. But that's why I'm optimistic about what the data processing systems can do, because they're just beginning to do it on a very, very small scale. James, two personal things before I let you leave. Number one, while we'll have an opportunity, some of us from time to time, to hear you speak or lecture, what can we expect next on uh, our uh, public television? I'm doing a series uh, which comes out in 1991. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, which is about some of the things we've been talking about, oddly uh -huh. enough. Um, it's really about... What, what I want to try and do is to... Is to we talked about it last night, didn't we? Uh, 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 I want to say, if you look at life on the planet, you see that the planet is blasted by, overloaded by solar radiation every day. Uh, it's pulsed. Wherever you live on the planet, there is a pulse of solar radiation at noon, a maximum the so solar, you know, the sun is high in the sky, and, that so, and at night it goes down to zero, mm -hmm. so you have this pulse every day. Mm -hmm. This pulse is so immensely overpowerful, uh, I mean, numbers of atomic bomb explosions every, every kilometre at the surface of the atmosphere, that's the strength of it. Even when it's filtered and gets to the ground, it has, in, it has tended to either destroy organisms that couldn't handle the overload or cause organisms who are, as I said earlier, this autopoetic system, who are capable right. of reorganizing themselves in order to maximize the overload by differentiating into subspecies, finding little niches in the ecosphere, becoming specialists, then setting up hierarchies to cascade the energy downwards so that nobody gets overloaded. In other words, evolution favors complexification. Mm -hmm. Complexification means more ways of channeling the energy flow, mm -hmm. more ways of using it, more, way, more ways of choosing bits of it. I want to say that's true also of human society and to look at history in terms of moments when there was a major perturbation in the environment, whether it was intellectual or physical, which drove society either to fail or to complexify. Mm -hmm. And that history consists of moving, and this is very much back to what you were saying earlier, from Chaos to order to chaos to order. So we come full circle. Very good, right. That's very why nice. it's very much what we were talking about today. I didn't know that was what we were going to be talking about. Uh, <laughs> James, last thing. And it's kind of, uh, you know, kind of very personal thing about what, I mean, your man who's really covered a lot of ground in the areas in which you've studied and the areas in which you've presented so there's a certain mastery, and yet I would suspect that back there someplace there's the idea that if and when I have the time, I'd love to get into. Yes. And can you tell us what that might be? Yes, you're going to laugh at the absurdly limited nature of it. <laughs> if I ever have time, I want to learn classical Arabic and write a book about the Arabs in Sicily. Uh -huh. Very good. Everybody's written about the Normans in Sicily, but there was nearly a renaissance before Florence destroyed by the Pope, because the Arabs were immensely sophisticated. Oh, they yes. brought us all the science we have. <laughs> and uh, when those guys went to Sicily in the 11th century, they found this incredibly beautiful, sophisticated organization, civilization, and lived with it happily, cheek by jowl, <laughs> Christians with Muslims. And who knows what would have happened if that society had not, been, not destroyed. been destroyed. So I want to... I, when, I'm, when I'm older, I'll do that. <laughs> James, just, I, I want to take a minute to thank you, and I know a simple thank you would do for you, and besides which, uh, 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 I've had the opportunity to be with you a couple of times, and I, uh, if you'll let me say it, you're funny about being acknowledged a little bit. But anyhow, I want to take a minute and thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, the remarkable job you've done with your television series, which... Uh, you know, I'm one of a very large audience who really not only enjoyed, but really gotten value from, been provoked by, been made to think. Uh, the other thing I'd like to thank you for or acknowledge you for is, uh, is sticking your neck out. <laughs> uh, you know, I have a, you know, maybe because I've had my neck stuck out a little bit, but never, I, I, I have a certain respect for that. But, you know, I want... To, to acknowledge you for both sticking your neck out and having a solid enough place to stand so that you're having stuck your neck out actually accomplish something. And if I were to, to characterize you for someone uh, beyond what you're popularly known for, I think that that's what I would say about you. And I really want to thank you for that, and I obviously want to thank you for being with us today. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks very much. I enjoyed it.